Hello everyone, my name is George McMillan. I'm the Executive Principal of Harris Academy Greenwich and Harris Academy Ockenden in Essex and pending planning permission also Harris Academy Avery Hill on the other side of uh, the high street. I'd like to present you to the man who runs the, the show here at uh, Harris Greenwich day to day, Mr Keeley. Good evening, my name is Ben Keeley. I'm the Principal of Harris Academy Greenwich and I'm really delighted to welcome you to our open evening, our virtual open evening 2020. Strange times. Uh, Mr. Keeley and I are trying to maintain social distance while not trying not to laugh um, at this sort of ridiculous affair. We're, we're usually, you know, welcoming up to 3,000 parents through our doors during the course of the week of Open Evening Week. Uh, and obviously, this is a completely uh, different world staring into a, a computer screen. So, um, we want to really uh, try and give you a real flavour for the school despite the, the difficult circumstances. Um, so we're going to run through our presentation and then there'll be a, an opportunity for you to ask any questions you would like in the, in the live part of the presentation that hopefully will happen uh, seamlessly. So Harris Grant is a school that I'm really, really proud of. Um, you know, I've got a little title there where the magic happens and it, and it really is a, a magic school. You know, from the outside as a parent, unless you're actually in education, secondary schools can seem like this, you know, horrendously confusing machine and you don't even know where to start choosing schools. I've just gone through it with my daughter, Connie, uh, choosing schools out in Surrey where we, where, where we live and it's been very, very challenging, uh, you, you know, even for someone who's supposed to be an expert to work out which school is going to be best for my, for my child. So I feel your pain. What's going to be really important is for us to be really honest about uh, what the school is like and what our expectations are and allow you to see inside the cockpit, so to speak, of, of our school. So where do we want to start? Well, I think it's really important that um, we have a vision for the school and it's one that we really connect with uh, in our academy. Uh, it's one that the, the staff refer to often. Um, it's not some glib thing that's on the front of your prospectus. And it is that our vision is to step into our greatness so our students can step into theirs. And let me talk to you a little bit about what I mean by this. Um, stepping into our greatness, the, the key word there isn't just greatness, which you would expect, but, but it's the, the word step. It's about for our staff about taking responsibility, taking responsibility for their professional development, taking responsibility to be the best version of themselves that they could possibly be. Um, you know, training really, really hard. And you'll you'll hear me refer to this uh, frequently uh, in the presentation, training hard so that they can really be on the top of their game. You know, leaving anything that's happening at home and bringing their whole selves to work uh, so that they can do the best job for, for our kids in our school. And, and that's what we expect for our students. We expect for our students to actually take responsibility and be the best version of themselves um, so that they can be the best that they possibly can be as well. So stepping into our greatness, a um, bit of a cheesy line, but it's one that we believe in passionately in, in our school. Now, um, I think a lot of schools maybe make the mistake of trying to attract parents by telling them what they want to hear. I, I don't want to tell you what you want to hear. I want to tell you what the schools actually like and what myself and Mr. Keeley over many years of working together um, have come to come to believe. So if you cut us in half and you look at our core, what is at the core of this school? And it's a series of beliefs that I want to briefly um, explain to you. So the first is that I think school should be a place that's really good fun for kids. You know, they 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 spend um, five or possibly seven if they stay on in the sixth form, you know, seven years in our school. They, they go from being a, a child, a kid to being a young adult. And uh, it's really important that we we make those five or seven years really fun. It's where you make your best friends. It's where you fall in love for the first time. It's, you know, where you get your 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 qualifications. It's where you, you know, you're great at some things and terrible at other things. It's where you learn. Uh, to be proud and it's also where you you know you find great humility and all, everything in between so it should be fun but it should also be really really challenging you know if kids brains aren't hurting at the end of the day then you know there, there's an issue um, and I certainly find every time that my, my children are bored at school I've got three kids when they're bored it really frustrates me because uh, it really switches them off and it means they're not learning it means they're essentially wasting their time and we, we want to make sure that your child is not wasting his or her time uh, number two is that effort counts. Um, I always say really publicly, uh, I, I don't, it doesn't really impress me a child being particularly academically gifted. You know, they, they were born that way and maybe it was nurtured, but you know, lucky them, would be do. The thing that really counts uh, also statistically is actually effort. When a child learns grit and resilience and how to dig in and not give up, 
uh, regardless of their ability, that will serve them better than any academic gift uh, that they may be uh, naturally given. So um, really that's what we look for and it's what we what we harp on about all the time to the kids. It's effort that counts most, not natural ability. It's the progress your child makes from when they first come in to, to when they leave. Uh, what else do we believe? We believe that all students, regardless of their background, should be polite and respectful and act with integrity. Well, um, uh, again, this tends to ruffle a few feathers sometimes that we, we don't care, uh, you know, what cultural background your child has, what colour their hair is, we don't care who their parents are, what their parents do for a living, we don't care uh, what, what postcodes you, you have, that none of that stuff matters. Uh, you know, I think between the two, as we've been working with teenagers for just about 40 years, uh, you know, you know, every single child can act with integrity. Every single ch child can be polite and respectful, regardless of their background. It's just a fact. There are no excuses. Um, and, you know, and that's something that, that parents really buy into who, who send their children here. We just see it year after year after year that no matter what you know, label you want to put on a child, we can teach that child to be respectful. Um, and we have exceptionally high standards around, around conduct and safety in, in our school. And that's not for everyone. You know, some parents, they prefer uh, a school that's much more laissez fair and, and, you know, a bit more hands off in terms of behaviour, maybe lower expectations because their kid gets to, you know, uh, be who they want to be or you know whatever phrase you want to put on there like we just have high expectations we expect our kids to behave end of story number four uh, we think the staff should be happy as well believe it or not we don't want to uh, push our staff so hard that they break we don't want to have staff who are burning out because of stress and pressure um, we want to hire the right staff who are also resilient and have grit, of course, but we want to have a good crack with our staff. We want to have uh, a really, really positive atmosphere as far away from toxic as you can possibly have. Um, and we want them to enjoy that, that professional success um, that comes year after year. You know, I think we've gone into our seventh year of uh, top 15 percent, often top 10 percent of schools in the country for progress. We're really proud of that. You know, we're a world class school. We've got that award. One of the only schools in the country won it twice in a row. So, you know, we want to have that success, but equally we don't want them to, to burn out. Um, we want to train them really hard because our belief is that the harder you train, the less hard you actually have to work because you just get better and better at your job and more streamlined. And then finally on this little list, we believe that parents need to take their part. We have high expectations of parents as well. Um, you know, as a bare minimum, and it doesn't sound like a lot, you know, we expect parents to send their kids to school because when they don't come to school, they're not learning. And um, we know that getting your child into school can be very, very challenging. Um, and, you know, we'll help help parents as much as possible with that. But we sometimes have a, you know, a small minority of parents who, who, who aren't as passionate, shall we say, about uh, education as we are. Uh, and we go and pick those kids up, kick them out of bed, right? We want, we want those children in school uh, learning. And we also want the parents to support the school. Like I say, for example, with behaviour, we have very, very high expectations. And uh, when things go wrong or when parents come down to the school and shouting and uh, complaining about how we've you know, given their child a detention and that their child's not sitting that detention because they believe the child, not the, not the teacher. Our teachers are professionals, OK? And uh, with our high expectations, we will set the sanctions or the rewards uh, as, as appropriate. We want parents to, uh, when there's a disagreement, work with us calmly and uh, quietly and supportively, and we will come to an agreement between the adults. And we'll always have a united front. Where teenagers, especially when they see a gap between the school and the parents, teenagers, in my experience, will exploit that and it will not do you as a parent any good. So we want to work really constructively with you to make sure that your child succeeds uh, in this school and becomes a wonderful uh, young person. So how do we do it year on year, seven years in a row? Well, as I said, we recruit great staff and we train them really hard. We don't, we don't um, you know, burn them out. We treat them really well. We make it fun, but also we, we make the, the systems work. So, you know, our teachers get a massive amount of uh, support with behaviour. This is an inner city London school with, uh, you know, inner city schools have got all these reputations of, you know, poor behaviour and out of control behaviour. It just doesn't happen here. Our behaviour is great because our systems really work and we support our staff. Um, and those those staff who've worked in other schools are ever so grateful that they come and work here. So so really the secret of our success is our is our staff. They are absolutely wonderful. The head teacher, Mr. Keeley, he still teaches. He teaches um, economics. I'm an executive head teacher. I still teach. I teach year eleven English. So you know uh, everybody is a teacher of of these students. We're not just stuck in a in an office um, somewhere. You know watching Netflix. We're we're out walking the walk. So Mr. Keeley is now going to chat to you about 
um, the Key Stage 3 curriculum, which you'll be most interested in for your child. So. Right. And our curriculum is something that we treasure here at Harris Academy Greenwich. It's something we've put a huge amount of work uh, into the design and the thought process behind each and every subject, but also within those subjects, the kinds of things that we encounter with students and want them to teach and learn and remember uh, forever uh, in their long term memory. So for us, the right balance is one that has great breadth. And as you can see here, your son or daughter would arrive at school and have the chance to study a range of subjects. Of course, the ones you would expect them to study, the English, maths, the sciences, things like that. We make a massive commitment to modern foreign languages at our school. We believe uh, it's our responsibility to meet the world as it is. And that is a world with a, a huge diverse range of languages spoken and an increasingly globalized world. And we want every child to learn a language all the way to GCSE. So that's a commitment we make for every child. Uh, we have a big belief about physical education. Uh, we think that every child should have the chance to uh, explore all aspects of physical education to find something that they love to do in terms of keeping fit and healthy. And maybe that could be a commitment they could carry on for the rest of their life. And school's a great place to really expand horizons for physical education. And then you see some other um, commitments we make there for kids. So we think it's really important that children should learn to cook, for example, or that they should have a chance to encounter music and, and fine art uh, and drama, um, and also computing, of course, in this increasingly technological uh, age in which we live. Now, there's a couple of unusual ones there that I'll just explain. Uh, PRE uh, is our philosophy, religion and ethics course, and it kind of covers kind of a, a citizenship and, and uh, government and uh, religious topics which we think are really important for helping us broaden our horizons and for understanding the world in which we live. And then in terms of our co-curricular offer, we have a opportunity for every child to choose from a range of electives. And those electives are where our staff and experts from outside uh, come together and think what would a great opportunity be for students to do which would push them a bit further beyond perhaps some of the traditional academic subjects that we might have described before. So things that those your son or daughter might choose from would be our, um, our good life projects where children are involved in designing and uh, building from the ground up their own garden project on site. Uh, they could choose to do uh, a newspaper project where they're led through the process of journalism and editorial skills and how to bring something together as part of a team. Or it could be a, a really niche, uh, a new sport offer that maybe we would bring in an expert coach, something like boxing or a martial art, where we would give the students the opportunity to choose uh, something unique uh, in the week for, to really give them a, a, a fresh perspective or a new skill which might bring joy to them for the rest of their life. And we, we stand by this curriculum and, and something that underpins all of these subjects that you see here is our commitment to what we call powerful knowledge. And powerful knowledge is the kinds of things that you wouldn't encounter at home or in your own life and is only really available to you in a school which is full of these subject experts and people who are really deeply immersed in their subject, be it in science or PE or computing or DT. We want to teach the powerful knowledge that students wouldn't encounter at home and which will enable them to build a brilliant education and open up doors long into the future. So to say we've spoken about our beliefs as a school, we've spoken about what we do with our staff and our huge commitment about them stepping into their greatness. And then what is the upshot of all that? What is the result? What will you see, fee, feel and hear with your child as they uh, go through the years at Harris Academy Greenwich? And when you come in to see us in a more normal times in the future, what will you see? So the first thing is we, we retain and we keep hold of our brilliant staff. Like George said, uh, the most important distinctive feature of this school is the 140 adults that turn up every day and work here. OK, that's what makes this school so successful. That's what makes this school more successful than our local neighbours. That's what makes this school's reputation so strong in our community. That's why 3000 people come through the door on a typical visit. That's why a thousand people sit the test to come here. It's because we have wonderful staff who we've trained and that we keep here so that they can build their career and educate your child. 
We mould great kids, right? We know what it's like moulding. It can be hard. As parents, we all know some days are better than others. But if we look at the long term, our aim is to mould wonderful children to develop the content of their character, to develop that idea of warm hearts and cool heads so that we have children really that are stepping into their adulthood uh, and ready to be successful. And that's tough at times, right? We'd have to work together. There's that relationship between home and school where sometimes we're both on the same page saying, do you know what? They need a bit of a kick up the backside at the moment. That's what molding looks like. And at other times it might be an academic stretch or an opportunity to go off and do a great careers visit, right? But it's various things which mean molding great kids. We've spoken about our curriculum. It is unashamedly ambitious. OK, we make no apology for that at our school. We expect every child, regardless of their starting point, regardless of how bad their primary school might be, regardless of if they had six months off in year six, regardless of if they have an SEN des designation, regardless if they find behaving difficult, they will study the same curriculum. And that curriculum is unashamedly ambitious and it is packed full of that powerful knowledge that we mentioned. On top of that, though, we want to give them the kinds of personal development and experiences they'll forever remember, okay, and that they'll never forget. Now, typically in a given year, that means some wonderful trips. That means a really comprehensive view of uh, London and the surrounding areas so that the kids can get out and broaden those horizons like we've mentioned. In this current context, it means giving them experiences through those electives like we've mentioned, but also allowing them to encounter a, a rich assembly program where we challenge beliefs, where we share uh, different perspectives out there in the world and really let children uh, grow and develop and nurture them so that they become adults who've got those rich experiences on which to draw. And finally, you know, and in some ways most importantly, because it is the core purpose of a school, is that we are going to, and I say that with a great certainty, right, at the 99.9% .9 of the time, we are going to make sure that your child gets a great set of exam results. Okay, this is a school that achieves extraordinary exam results, it achieves the best exam results in Greenwich for a mainstream school and has done for uh, as long as I can remember working here uh, and also within Lewisham uh, which is on our doorstep as well many of you might be from neighbouring local authorities so we are a school that uh, makes no apology for placing, placing great emphasis on exam results and working hard and being successful in the classroom is very very important to us. Now, I think that gives you a really good flavour of what life is like at Harris Academy Greenwich. Now, there is going to be a live Q&A, of course, which you are all richly invited to, and we expect to see you there. And I'm going to answer lots and lots of questions on that evening. Uh, but there are a few predictable ones that we always uh, kind of tap into before we throw it open to questions uh, from parents. So I'm going to touch upon a few uh, questions that often arise and that we've got a very clear answer for so that you can be uh, sure of what kind of school this is. So firstly, we're expecting a lot of COVID-19 questions. Now, uh, we've been working incredibly hard, as have many schools, of course, to make sure that they can reopen safely. Uh, we've been very pleased to say up to this point, it's been a completely COVID-free school. Uh, we've got measures such as uh, extra hand washing facilities, one way systems, social distancing, staggered start times and finish times. We've got special uh, cleaning regimes. We've got additional cleaners working at school all day on touch points. We've got a whole host of things that have meant that our parents, our current parents and our staff have been very, very reassured to send their children back to school. If I look at attendance today, attendance today in year seven and eight, for example, uh, is above 95%. So I think that is a very clear vote from our parents, from our children. Our staff attendance is 100% uh, today. Our staff, our parents and our children vote that this is a place where people can work and learn safely. The school day. Typically, we run a slightly longer school day at Greenwich and we, we're up front about that. So children will uh, start early on a Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday. They have a wonderful opportunity where they come into school and they read. Reading is vitally important to us at Greenwich. We place great emphasis on reading for pleasure and we make no apology. If, if children struggle with reading, that's absolutely fine, but we expect them to work hard on it. We give them bucket loads of support and we get them catching up with their peers very, very quickly. So Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, your child will come to school at 8.25. They will read in class uh, a set text, uh, a wonderful book where they're all reading together with their teacher and they're, they're reading around the room and they're developing 
um, a great love and passion for reading. So 8.25 is a typical start time and then it will go on to 3.30. So the reading uh, does carry on uh, and the school day runs all the way through to 3.30 and there are five lessons in the school day. So there is a little bit of chopping and changing for them to do. That is unusual after life at primary school, but we find they get used to it very, very quickly. Special educational needs. Um, when Harris first took over uh, Elton Green, going back uh, almost a decade now, uh, there were virtually no SEN students in the school and quite rightly so because as an SEN parent you would never have wanted your child to attend this school 10 years ago. Fast forward 10 years, we are probably the most uh, popular school for SEND students in the local area. Uh, we are rightfully popular for a place which offers a wonderful, calm and peaceful and productive learning environment which I think is the primary reason we're popular with SEND parents. They know that their son or daughter is going to be able to come to school and learn uh, in, a, in a wonderful environment that is nurturing, but also one where their child is seen. We have a real emphasis on seeing students and knowing who they are, uh, particularly with our SEND students who have some of those more complex needs. So SEND is very, very popular at our school. Um, but to come back to some of George's points earlier, uh, there are some parents perhaps who, who don't see the way we work here with SEND as exactly the way they would want because like George said earlier on behaviour, on uh, the expectations we have for being polite and well mannered and, and doing the right thing, we have very, very high expectations for all children. Now of course people make mistakes but those will be rightfully challenged and we will ask for even better the next day. We want an improvement, we want to see you getting even better at that. And, and next week and next month and next year, look at the progress you've made, look at how far you've come. And we will always insist on those standards and we will always push children regardless of, of their background, regardless of their SEND. And on the other side, uh, like we say, on the curriculum side, this is not a school where, where SEND children will be removed frequently from the classroom and be working in small groups kind of down the end of a corridor uh, with a teaching assistant. This is a school where those children will be in the classroom you know, 95% of the time, and they'll be engaging in the same curriculum with wonderful support from our SEND team and with great teachers who've been trained really well to, to deal with that. So that's what a typical experience for SEND is. If you'd like to speak more about that on the day, all our team will be available for questions. Is there bullying at the school? Very important question, and the answer to that is yes. And sometimes people are a bit surprised that I say yes to that. And alluding to George's point earlier, you might go to some uh, presentations at other schools where they kind of paper over the cracks of reality and, and humanity and, and life. Uh, but in, in, in real truth, of course there is bullying at this school, but it is vanishingly rare, okay? Because the moment we spot it, okay, on that very rare occasion where there is a kind of persistent verbal, it's normally verbal really uh, in 2020, or on the very rare occasions physical, uh, then we come down on it like a ton of bricks, okay? that child will typically be excluded from school for a period of time. Uh, they will have a return to school meeting with me and their parents, and they will be assured that if anything like that were to continue, they will have to find another school immediately. Okay, and no one has ever crossed that line on bullying for me. We've never had to permanently exclude the child for bullying at this school, okay, because they get the message very, very quickly. It normally lasts the first couple of weeks of year seven, and then it finishes. But yes, it does happen from time to time. Do we deal with it incredibly forcefully? Yes, okay. And we think that's a successful way of managing it uh, for everyone in the building. Yeah, it's also maybe just worth adding that we're, we're also very highly skilled in restorative justice as well. So we, we actually get children who, because often it starts from squabbling, uh, certainly in our experience with, with girls, uh, you know, there'll be some sort of squabble, social media is often involved. Um, and, and it kind of and it kind of goes out there and, uh, and then out of control. So we're, we're very good at getting groups of children together and actually talking things out and squaring things away and getting things back to normal again. So it's a kind of um, a balance between restorative justice and uh, and obviously the you know sanctions and possibly even the ultimate sanction, which fortunately we have not had to yet press are we? No. So extracurricular activities so on top of our elective a reminder on the elective front every child in year seven eight and nine has a whole period a week dedicated to an elective of their choice where they choose from those kinds of things like the good life projects or gardening uh, specialist pe uh, making a newspaper those kinds of things okay that's the primary uh, extracurricular activity but on top of that of course 
We have a wonderful and vibrant music and drama and art scene, okay, where students get involved in kind of big projects, whether it's to celebrate Black History Month down in the art team, whether it's to put on a wonderful Christmas performance from the drama team, whether it's a musical ensemble, the choir uh, in music, there are uh, bigger opportunities there. And then of course, there is our sporting opportunities. This is a very, very successful school when it comes to our sports teams. And we have a, a vast range, uh, array sorry, of sport, both for, for boys and girls, which is very, very well uh, supported and participated in by year seven every year. And there's trials and, and it's a competitive process, but there's also opportunities for health and fitness outside of traditional school time as well. There is a police officer that you might see in and around our school building from time to time. That's a completely normal thing in London secondary schools. It's a mayor of London uh, kind of program, which was designated a few years ago, that the Metropolitan Police work as closely as they can. They're called the liaison officer, and they have a number of schools under their wings. So our officer works in a number of different schools lo locally. And to be honest, most of the things he does here is he wanders around McDonald's to make sure um, everyone's keeping safe over there. He'll talk to a few children that might be on the wrong side uh, of a disagreement or something that might get a bit worse. Uh, and just, just so they're clear that if something happened on social media or if something happened on the high street on a Saturday, then actually it's people like him that might have to get involved. And it's actually very successful just sharing with children the realities of life beyond the school gate and how the police might play a role in that. What happens if we or both of us, I should say, get run over uh, by a bus? We don't um, go on the same bus for a start. So no, make sure that doesn't happen. And we don't drive each other to school, so there won't be <laughs> uh, a problem on that front either. But look, I think what we want to get across is this school would continue to be exactly as it is today if neither of us were here. And that's because of a, a firm commitment to a sustainable leadership model where our leadership teams uh, that work with us uh, have all been here for, for many years themselves, know the school inside out and back to front, and would be able to do at least a good a job uh, as we could uh, running the show. So we always like to assure people this is a school with a very sustainable staffing model. This is not the kind of place where the head teacher changes every five minutes and it's a whole new set of faces for you to look at on the school gate. There are people here who've known families over many years and can easily step in and run the show if it were needed. I'm just going to pass back to George now because there are some burning questions normally about admissions and we can answer some of those for you at this point. OK, so admission is always a, always a hot topic, so I will try to um, convey this to you uh, as clearly as possible. So um, just about the, uh, our, our philosophy, first of all. So um, basically what it comes down to is that, especially in an inner city school where you've got schools that are very close to each other, you know, we've got Eltham Hill just around the corner, there's Crown Woods, there's, um, uh, you know, we've got, um, you know, the Willis Poly and we've got Thomas Tallis and all, all of them within really within walking distance from each other. Um, or at least cycling distance from each other. And all, all of the schools, in my opinion, should take their fair share of students from each demographic uh, and each ability group. Um, I believe that um, schools should be comprehensive. Um, I don't think that we should have sync schools. I don't think they should end up um, in a place you know, where, where local parents are priced out of the community because they can't afford to buy houses because the school's a really good school. And so therefore, they, you, you know, they get kind of squeezed out house prices and rent prices are crazy enough in London without without that happening. Now, because um, uh, Mr. Keeley and I both believe that, um, you know, our school should be comprehensive, we don't want to be a grammar school by the back door. Uh, we have uh, introduced a, a system of banding. It's really common. Um, it used to be common throughout the whole of Greenwich, actually, but um, it is common across the across the Federation. So allow me to, to take you through it. So first of all, um, all children will set a non-verbal reasoning test. Now, we offer two test dates. One has already been. Um, and we do advertise that on our on our school website. So by the time you see this video, I imagine that they've already um, set up some some people have already sat the test, or you can sit the test in in December. What we do is um, we use a pro professional company for for that. They they provide us with the tests. Um, the children will um, come in on uh, uh, early in December. We will write to you and tell you when your uh, when your test date is. You will bring your child, and we'll all be socially distanced. We'll have several sittings. Uh, and a sort of cleaning operation between each sitting. 
And the results of these tests will, will create nine bands of ability. Now, it does not matter what your test score is. In fact, you're not even, we don't even write to you and tell you what your test score is because it, it's irrelevant. We don't care about the ability of your child. This is purely to make sure that we have a comprehensive intake and make sure you know, we don't just take all the really smart academic kids that we take uh, you know, a whole range of children with different abilities. So um, the number of children we accept in each band does tend to differ slightly year on year because it depends what the national distribution actually is. So, you know, on average, you'll get a certain number of kids in band five on average. And so that's the number of children that we will take um, as a percentage. So it's really, really fair. Um, it does, you know, there's there's no system that's perfect, but we think it's the fairest way to, to ensure uh, a, a comprehensive school. So within each of these nine, nine bands, we give priority, which is, um, you know, the first one is legally. So if you, your child has an EHCP plan or what used to be called a statement of needs, your child will be given priority. Uh, or if your child is in, indeed in care uh, or has been adopted, that child is then given priority. Then we have children of staff. Um, then we have siblings and then we have distance and distance is just purely a straight line between your front door and our front door and that's calculated on a sort of computer software package that the council run for us. Um, it does not matter which borough you're in, so we don't have a preference for Greenwich or Lewisham or Bromley or whatever. Um, we just take um, children who are uh, closest by distance. Now, what you might be interested in is this uh, table here. It is on our school website, so you can have a look at that. We've only run this admissions policy for one year. So this is last year's data. So what you can see down the left hand side of your screen will be the bands from one to nine. OK, like I say, it doesn't really matter which way around it is. As, as it happens, one is the lowest um, ability band and nine is the highest. OK, so five is your sort of middle ability kit. Now you can see um, how many places available for offers. So for example, in band five, we offer the most number of children, 36. That's because the majority of kids in the country are sitting around band five. All right, so we, we, we take most of, those, most of those bands. Now, last year in band five, six siblings uh, happened to take those, those first six places, and then the remaining 30 were offered on distance. Now, the, the catchment area for that band is significantly up on when we have done this with no banding. So in many ways, it gives you a better chance of getting in. Uh, so that was three and a half kilometers um, what was given on that banding. But if you look at some of the other bands where nationally they are, there are fewer children who sit in that band. So for example, uh, band one, which is the, the lower ability range, um, there are only seven uh, places given. And each of those seven places, it just so happened by fluke last year, were taken by siblings. And so we didn't offer any on distance. Uh, in the, the top academic band, again, we only offer seven places for top children. You can see we don't want to become a grammar school by, uh, you, you know, by accident or, or by design. Um, and you can see there three siblings took the places, then that left four to offer on distance. And that was about 811 metres away. So a very, very small catchment area for, for, that, uh, for that top band. Now, of course, this throws up some problems for, for parents and uh, you know, it becomes problematic if there aren't, aren't enough places for siblings. You know, if there's nine siblings, but there's only seven places available in the first place, we're aware that um, you know, there's a very, very, very small number of, um, uh, of children that this may affect, um, but we feel it is the, the, the fairest way to offer it. If you'd like to chat any more about our admissions policy, the admissions policy is actually on, on our website, of course. You can chat to Mrs. Henderson, who is our admissions officer, and you can email her um, via the school and um, she will get back to you with any questions that you might have. So that's the end of our uh, of our recorded part of our presentation. We've managed to do it with only one person walking into the classroom behind us, <laughs> one school bell and one police siren going back, uh, going along the main road. So hopefully um, this has been nice and clear for you. Um, I'm going to end it here. We would like to thank you for your attention um, and uh, there will be an opportunity to ask questions at the live event. Thank you.